If you're joining us for the first time, we are the Knoxville History Project. Our mission is to research, preserve, and promote the history and culture of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, you can find a recorded version of this talk within about 48 hours, thanks to Nicole, and it's through our new Engage section on our main website, knoxvillehistoryproject.org. And you'll find them under the History Happy Hour icon as well as our driving tours and also uh, connect through to uh, Knoxville Walking Tours, which uh, is the company that Laura does uh, some wonderful walking tours, mainly downtown, but also at uh, Old Grey and the Knoxville National Cemetery and uh, Knoxville Botanical Gardens. So uh, check those out as well. Uh, I want to thank uh, City Council members, Lynn Fugate and Charles Thomas uh, for funding uh, this series this year. So tonight, uh, we're thrilled that Laura Stell is going to be joining us. Uh, we've Myself and Jack have uh, been working with this book uh, published by the Knoxville History Project, uh, just come out this week or last week. And also want to thank uh, the city of Knoxville as part of the Suffrage Celebration Seed Fund that uh, shared a generous grant through uh, Knox County Public Library and also Visit Knoxville as well for providing funding for this book. So uh, I'm going to, uh, you can find it on our website, in our online store. It's also available at Knoxville Walking Tours from Laura directly. Uh, if you do a tour with Laura, she also carries a little stock with her. And also it's available at Union Avenue Books right now as well. So uh, several opportunities to, to get it. It's a hundred page book full of uh, color pictures and great stories. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jack to introduce Laura and uh, start telling this story. Thanks, Jack. All right, all right, thank you, Paul, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is a uh, we're glad to have this this out. It's been a long time coming. We began talking about doing something probably three years ago or so, because we knew the centennial of the Nineteenth Amendment was coming up in uh, in twenty twenty, uh, and uh, there are so many stories so, and so many uh, issues uh, that that people talk about when they talk about the the suffrage movement. Uh, but they all seem kind of dry and theoretical until until you can see where it happened, until you can actually be in these places where it happened. And uh, this is something that we uh, you, you can hear about uh, Lizzie Crozier French, and and I've always pointed out her grave at Old Gray Cemetery. Uh, but to actually you know be able to picture the house where she lived in and the in the in the various buildings where she gave speeches and and uh, and and all these things and how it all worked together and how it influenced other people uh, and may, may have changed the course of, uh, of American history in the end, because it, as we all know, Tennessee was the state that passed uh, the, uh, the, the 19th Amendment uh, and made it, uh, became the 36th state that made it law across the whole nation. Uh, and it here at, in Tennessee, it, it was a hair's breadth difference. So uh, just, just it took just a little influence to one legislator or, or another. Uh, to uh, to make the difference uh, uh, that uh, that you never know what speech or what you know demonstration or what letter uh, might have might have have tipped the balance. Um, but Laura had uh, was working has been doing tours with us our longtime partner. She's uh, has several tours that she gives and one is called Misbehaving Women, and she had been telling some of these stories and I think wanted to enhance this and and learn more and and, and create a, a, a even fuller tour. Uh, to tell the full story of suffrage in Knoxville, going back to the uh, back to the years after the Civil War and carrying into the mid 20th century and and even beyond to the the days that we elected a female mayor, uh, the first of two so far, um, uh, to uh, to tell the to tell the whole story and uh, and she began looking into this and found a lot of stories, several stories I had never heard before, stories about. You know, nationally known suffragists like uh, like Maud Younger. I'll let her tell that story later. But it sounds like an outlaw, doesn't it, Maud Younger? But she was almost like that. Was a uh, was a, a, a national militant who was here and had a very dramatic uh, uh, event on the uh, on, on the courthouse steps in 1917, some years before the 1920 vote. And then, of course, there was Carrie Chapman Catt, a more, even more famous suffragist, who was here in town. Uh, staying at the Farragut Hotel, which is now still there in the Hyatt, and that's that's uh, uh, Laura will be talking about that too, I'm sure. Uh, but these locations are are still there. Many of them are are fascinating. Uh, are some of them, the ones that are still there, are interesting, but the ones that are not still there are just as interesting. And we, uh, Laura, did a lot of re research into the uh, buildings uh, that were not uh, that that are not not still there, and trying to picture them. And we have photographs of them, some of them in the book. 
Um, but one thing that kind of eluded us, and especially uh, last year we were uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, we were trying to, we hadn't, didn't have a lot about uh, black history in the suffrage movement. And uh, we were trying to find out any, any connection at all. And Laura found a, a few uh, interesting and valuable uh, things to, to, uh, to, find, to uh, include. Uh, but I also uh, I wanted to try to make some connection to Ida B. Wells, who was the most famous of the black suffragists. And did she have any connection to Knoxville at all? She was from West Tennessee and, and, uh, and famously left there uh, to move north uh, later on. But was she ever in Knoxville? Did she ever do anything here? And I was actually doing some research on a on a related subject. I'd run across a, a an unusual convention that's not very well known called the Afro American League, which had their second ever convention in Knoxville, a national organization uh, that met in Knoxville at the old Logan Temple on uh, on uh, just off State Street in the Marble Alley area uh, uh, today, but the, uh, uh, in 1891, 130 years ago, this past summer, the Afro-American League met in Knoxville and they had an unannounced speaker. I'm not sure whether she was a completely welcome speaker because it was an all male league, but she, this woman, young woman uh, from the Memphis area got up and spoke uh, at, at this convention and her name was Ida B. Wells. And she even got the attention of the uh, Knoxville reporters uh, because she was a, just in her 20s at the time and was was uh, was very outspoken and in insisting that black women should be part of the uh, of the civil rights movement uh, in the 1890s. Uh, later on, she was uh, in the 20th century. She was uh, was was trying to, to put herself into the in, make make black women part of the mostly white suffrage movement in Washington and elsewhere. But we're glad we got that story into the book as well. But I, I have a, my own story in the book, and I'll just tell that quickly and, and yield to Laura. There's one story in the book is written by me, and it's the story of Anderson, Harrison, Wade. It sounds like a baseball combination. But uh, Anderson, Harrison, Wade were the three legislators from Knoxville. I, I kept hearing these stories about Harry Byrne, the famous story about Harry Byrne and his mother, and the letter and the and the the vote that changed uh, the changed Tennessee and changed the the, the country, uh, but I also had to say, well, Knoxville legislators were there too. Uh, were, did they even show up that day? We don't hear about them. Uh, so I wanted to find out what they were, how they voted, and it turned out that all three of the legislators from Knoxville voted for uh, the suffrage amendment. Uh, their names were were uh, Kendall Anderson, Joe Harris, and Joe E. Wade. Uh, three very, very different guys, all three were, Republic, all three were Republicans, uh, but very different fellows. Uh, Harris was, uh, was about 70 years old, and uh, from what I read about him, he was kind of, uh, kind of irascible, kind of an adventurous fellow, who would, who, but, uh, but, but, but kind of restless in his uh, later years. Uh, he had spent some time in the, in the Wild West. Uh, he was a land auctioneer and had been out West for a while. Had, had been in politics early in Knoxville back in the 1880s. And, and it's interesting that he, uh, he uh, uh, during the 1880s, during the, the War of the Roses between the Taylor brothers, uh, people kept saying, which side are you on? Which side are you on? And, and he would say, uh, I, I don't give a damn for anybody but the ladies. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was his, his, uh, his quote. Uh, of course, it probably wasn't as progressive as it was uh, as it was uh, 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 courtly or something. Uh, but uh, but that was his uh, that was the way he liked to be seen as the guy that didn't care about any politics, but but he cared about women. Um, but uh, he was a, he was a poet. He actually uh, gave a poet and uh, a poem read a poem at a union uh, uh, veterans organization that was that was uh, mourning the death of. Uh, Philip Sheridan in the 1880s. Um, he was a Maryville College grad, by the way. Two of the people involved in this story were Maryville College grads. I'm interested to, to, to note. Um, but uh, but uh, very interesting fellow. Um, uh, another one was uh, Joe E. Wade, very young guy. He was in his 30s at the time. He was a legislator. He was a plumbing inspector from Knoxville. And he, he committed early. And he, he made sure that people would forget him by committing early because uh, nobody was talking about how Joey Wade was gonna vote that summer of 1920, that very dramatic summer in Nashville uh, when people were wondering who, how everybody was gonna vote because Joey Wade had already pitched in with the suffragists. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, Joe Harris, the older guy and, uh, and more so Kendall Anderson, uh, W.K. Anderson were, were, uh, were uncommitted uh, 
and and uh, W.K. Anderson. This is this is a picture of him, uh, kind of a Lincoln-esque figure, it seems. But he was a lawyer. He was an attorney, worked downtown. Uh, in fact, he was one of the first people to move into the Holston building, uh, uh, which was uh, an office building when it was finished in 1913. Was an attorney, worked for the, the firm that included John K. Shields, uh, who was a U.S. senator at the time. Um, but uh, was uh, he was on the school board, uh, very very committed to uh, to furthering uh, uh, better schools in Knoxville. Lived in Nos in South Knoxville, uh, but he was uh, about suffrage. He was, in his own word, noncommittal uh, as we went into the summer of 1920, and that's the reason that his name, uh, not yet Harry Burns, but uh, W. K. Anderson's name, was in newspapers from Boston to Los Angeles as we entered the uh, the summer of 1920, and people were wondering how the Tennessee legislature was going to vote. Uh, he finally tipped his hat towards suffrage uh, a week or two before the vote. Uh, so uh, he was not uh, any longer considered one of the uh, the, uh, the central figures in that uh, in that story. Uh, by the way, I, there's, a, uh, there's a, a story about how the Knoxville delegation vote, all three voted for suffrage. Uh, there was also a, a, a fourth representative from Nos County who voted against suffrage, uh, a guy named Cassidy, who, whose district included part of West Nos County. But the three Knoxville delegates voted for suffrage, and some uh, reporters noted that after the after the big vote in August of 1920, uh, the vote began and ended with uh, with uh, Knoxville delegates. Uh, uh, Anderson was the first, and he he shouted "I" very heartily to open the vote on the on the floor. They did it in a roll call in a in a uh, an alphabetical order. Anderson was first. The last one was Joe E. Wade, and he he voted uh, "I" as well at the very end of the voting, and people knew that it was that it was over. Um, but um, uh, this was a uh, 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 you know a, a major thing, and and uh, Lizzie Crozier French was so grateful to the uh, Knoxville delegation that she had a big, uh, a, a big party for them, a big banquet. And uh, Paul, I think we have a picture of that, uh, that banquet. We may, we may show it later or, oh yeah, yeah, here we go. And here's this banquet uh, for uh, that, that in which the honored guests were the, de the Tennessee delegation. And I, I don't know for sure which ones it was, but I, I see these three guys uh, kind of down at the bottom of the, of the, of the picture. And one of them looks like uh, the guy on the right to me looks like W.K. Anderson, uh, that that guy there. And whether that old guy next to him is Harris and the other guy Wade, I I can't say for sure. But uh, but that but they were in that room somewhere and being honored that night and, and got to got to speak that night. Uh, but this was in the uh, in the women's building. Uh, 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 it was known as uh, the Lyceum. Uh, Laura will talk about that later. But without further ado from me, I, these guys all have kind of, uh, two of them have kind of sad stories uh, as we go on. Uh, and I, I might talk about a bit about that. Uh, they were famous that day. And I think after that, almost everybody forgot about them. None of them were remembered for their suffrage vote uh, in their obituaries, for example. And I, I can't find any mention of them in the newspaper after 1920 for having Having voted for suffrage, I think it was it was it was old news for a while before it came history. I think that was just a reality of how people think about things. They're tired of thinking about something; it's over. It's they're not talking about it anymore. And years later, it becomes historical and of great interest. And and that was it was only then that people been, began remembering people like Harry Byrne. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm I'll yield the floor to uh, to Laura Still, who's been do doing some some great research on this. For over you know, a couple of years now, I guess we've worked with the Laura. We worked a little bit with Han Hannah Rexroth to be sure at the East Tennessee Historical Society a couple of years ago, and to be sure that we were uh, all on the same page and and uh, and uh, trying to uh, trying to cover everything we can. But this is a fairly thorough book that she put together, and and I'm I'm glad that she's here to to talk about it. Uh, Laura, Laura Still. Okay, well, hi everybody. Um, I hope that uh, you're going to enjoy this. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna skip right over that. Uh, we're, I wanna talk basically just about, you know, the project came together pretty quickly. Uh, I had been researching this since 2018 when we'd had a meeting at the History Museum for just interested parties. I think Jack was there that day too. And uh, we were just talking about cert what sorts of things we might be able to do. And of course I immediately thought, well, I could do a tour. So that very same year they did a, for the history fair, I did a short version of Misbehaving Women. And I just chose that title 
because obviously of the uh, sociologist, is it uh, Lauren uh, Ulrich? She, uh, she came up with this phrase in one of her studies that said, well-behaved women never make history. And that's on t-shirts and bumper stickers and everywhere. <laughs> so I thought, well, if I'm gonna talk about the women who did make history, I'm gonna talk about the ones that misbehaved. So that's why I named the tour that. And I, I noticed that year that uh, I had over 50 persons on these tours. They were just short little free tours for the history uh, project, you know, history fair, and I thought, wow, if that many people are interested in a 45-minute tour, I could probably expand this then and maybe make it into a year, uh, a full-time tour. So I started working on that, and then uh, this seed money became available, uh, and it was Paul, really, who had the, uh, the know-how and had the idea to try to get the grant, and we were successful in going for a grant and were able to start to uh, talking about doing a tour together. And of course, we had a lot of plans that didn't come off because of the pandemic, but I think we managed to get most of the stuff done that we, we wanted to do. Um, I did a previous talk earlier during the pandemic about uh, uh, some of the stuff that I uh, uh, uncovered. So I'm gonna cover some of that stuff fairly briefly tonight, but you see on the screen there, the slide is for all the kind of the national leaders and these were the ladies who pretty much started the movement, uh, starting with Elizabeth Cady Staunton and Lucretia Mott. Uh, Susan B. Anthony kind of came into it a few years later through her friendship with Mrs. Staunton, but uh, Alice Paul was sort of the militant section. <laughs> she was the one who broke off from the uh, uh, NAWS as Association to form the National Women's Party because the others would re refuse to use the tactics that she had learned in England. She had gone to get a PhD in social work and from Br British suffragists learned to do protest, protest marches and uh, picket places. And so she wanted to do that here in the US and they wouldn't support it. So she formed her own or organization. Now, Carrie Chapman Catt, of course, took over when Susan B. Anthony uh, uh, was getting older, she realized this was going to be a very long fight. <laughs> And so she started training younger women and Carrie Chapman Catt was one of those. They were called Susan's Girls. And it's sort of a tradition in the women's movement, I think, to put the next generation of leadership in place. And we have, you know, like any social movement, all these things go through several lifetimes and we have had various people not make it to the end of the road. So fortunately, all of our, these ladies who started this movement realized that this was going to be a long road and they began putting leadership in place. And Carrie Chapman Catt was one of those. She was one of Susan's girls. And as you see her as an older woman here, that's because that's how old she was when the thing finally passed. <laughs> so it takes a while. You can't just get this done overnight. And it was a huge change to put on, put forward in society. And it's really hard for us as modern women to think about this because you know, if we want to go lunch with our friends, if we want to go to a nightclub with our friends, there's nobody going to stand and say, no, you can't do that. You know, if you feel like you want to, it's perfectly within your, your power and it, society is not going to really look at you funny for doing something like that. That's not how it was. <laughs> and we have come, you know, we've had to overcome a whole lot of societal prejudice prejudice and cultural prejudice to get to where we are today. And it's really hard for us to imagine what these women had to overcome to get just a few steps farther along. Now, Jack did mention that we wanted to kind of include the African-American and the black ladies who worked for suffrage. And they really, unfortunately, there was a split between the two movements and it was partially caused by the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment for the first time isolated gender as a requirement to vote. So it was for black men only and it was stated black men. So um, that caused Frederick Douglass and uh, Mrs. Staunton to, to split apart from each other. Now, I have to say Susan B. Anthony, maybe she, uh, she, was, she disagreed with him over that, but somehow they managed to stay friends. Uh, when he died, she spent a week at his house. They even had a bedroom in the Douglas house that was called the Susan's room. <laughs> so that was, she spent a lot of time with him and his family. And so they, they still managed to be friends and get over this, this ugly race, racist rhetoric that came out of this split. And that is one of the things that I think I didn't really see addressed before I started looking into this. And I wanted to address that because it was very real. Both sides used racist rhetoric. It wasn't just the anti-suffragists. The suffragists used it too because they, they played this race card whenever they, had, they felt like it was to an advantage. And unfortunately here in the South, that's where they played it the most. 
because they felt like Southerners would be would support this amendment if they thought that the giving white women the vote would allow them to outnumber the black population. And I'm sad to say sometimes people still use it that way. And it's it's a uh, it, but it was something that caused Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells to have to work very, very hard to get recognition for the work that they did. Now, both of these ladies are in my book because they both came here. And uh, Ida B. Wells, Jack has already talked about, she came here for that the convention of the African American League and she would go on and become you know, very famous. And in the suffrage movement was one of the few ladies who they, you know, they tried to segregate the pr protest marches of the white ladies. Some did not want to march with the black women. So Ida was one of the few who just would not take that. And she, in one particular occasion uh, in 1918, she just waited for the parade around the corner and just joined her, <laughs> her, her, her people from her state, whether they wanted her or not. She was determined she was going to march. So uh, Mary Church Terrell was here twice. She came in 1909 uh, and lectured at Knoxville College. Uh, the paper did mention that she was there and was lecturing, unfortunately, did not cover her lecture, so we don't know what she was talking about. However, by that time, she was pretty famous for discussing uh, various subjects, lynching, uh, civil rights, um, uh, and suffrage in general, not just for women, but also for people, uh, the anti-suffrage uh, laws or Jim Crow laws that were going into effect to keep black men from voting as well. So she was she could have lectured on any of those subjects and I'm sure suffrage was included. But she came back in 1910 to the uh, Appalachian uh, Exposition out at Chilhowee Park and they had a colored person's building and that's where she lectured and she apparently did two or three days worth. Uh, she stayed for a few days and again they didn't cover the lectures but we know that she was here and that she lectured several times. What interested me most is I wondered how she happened to be invited to Knoxville College, how she happened to know anything about Knoxville. And that's when I was searching for anything to do with suffrage and black women or women of color. And I turned up that Maggie Irwin Johnson, Cal Johnson's second wife, was, went to Chicago as the representative to the African-American, uh, it was sort of the forerunner of the, uh, a, the NAACP. And so it was the African-American Women's League. And so she went to Chicago as part of their national convention and she was the, the East Tennessee representative. And I believe and Ms. Tara was the, the uh, president there. So she would have met her there. And I'm, I think that is how she got an invitation to Knoxville because Maggie Irwin Johnson was there. They became uh, acquainted with each other and she probably issued the invitation and you know, worked with her in, in arranging a trip to Knoxville. Now, this is a pretty familiar statue to most everyone. You know, this, the, the book goes into the fact that there is, you know, there had to be people on the ground. Uh, it, a national movement goes nowhere if there's no grassroots movement on the ground. So local politics is always important. <laughs> and really local, all politics are local, I believe someone said. So these ladies were chosen in 2006, this statue was placed on Market Square and these ladies were chosen by each section, West, Middle and East Tennessee, uh, got to choose the woman they wanted to represent us. The Suffrage Coalition uh, uh, put this, to, this statue up and Alan McGuire is the sculpture. Uh, Elizabeth Avery Merriweather represents West Tennessee and Ann Dallas Doug, uh, Dudley was the uh, Middle Tennessee representative. Of course, we have Lizzie as ours. Uh, I do like to mention that uh, Meriwether was a bit of a controversial choice <laughs> for West Tennessee because she was a slave owner. And she wrote for the several books for the Lost Cause Movement. And in fact, she continued to write uh, an, uh, all of her very long life. She produced her memoirs at the age of 92. <laughs> they were published in, in the St. Louis papers. By then she had moved to St. Louis. So uh, and had lived there several years. So they were published serially in the St. Louis paper, but she defended the old South to the very end. And it's very hard for us to reconcile her beliefs about uh, women's suffrage with her beliefs about civil rights for other races. So uh, it's, it's sort of part of the way our history is. There's never anybody you can have, you can't ever have a hero is what I'm always telling everyone. There really are no good old days. If you study hard enough, you're gonna find out it never was much better than it is today. Um, in fact, a lot of ways it, it was very much worse. So uh, 
the uh, we still I think we're very lucky in that our East Tennessee representative here was Lizzie Crozier French, who by the way uh, probably wrote well, when she was a child her family owned slaves too. Her father was a, a Confederate when he was uh, here in Knoxville, and uh, I expect they owned a few slaves in the house, but. She never seemed to feel that made her uh, an Old South person. She was not really a, uh, a person who considered her wealth, even though she used it for uh, she used it for other people. And one of the things that struck me about her obituary is that they said she could have died a wealthy woman, but she used her position in society and the and the advantages with which she had been born to help other people. So uh, you kind of have to admire her, her ability to continue to, to go against that grain. Now, these are some pictures of Lizzie. The one on the left is the one you always see, and it's the one on the cover of the book. That's when she was young and beautiful. But I want you, as, as illustration, see the one on the right? That's what she looked like when she ran for office in 1924. So this is a long haul. She spent over 40 years of her life working for this cause. And I really... Though I, I honor the fact she started as a young woman, I really feel like we need to not let older women be so invisible. She, she worked hard and she achieved her greatest achievements in her 50s and 60s. She was 68, I believe, when, the, when it finally passed. And she ran for office in 1924 at the age of 72. Uh, she really achieved her biggest goals in her 60s and, and 70s. And uh, even though she did not win the election, she was, it was very close. Uh, maybe if, if we had, the, she won the same percentage in an at-large uh, election for city council today, I think she, she would have won perhaps. But she, she was not uh, a jealous woman. And even though she lost, she held a big banquet for the winners. <laughs> so she, uh, well, the winners uh, are covered in the book, of course. This is another picture that I really like of her because it's in front of the park house. Her house was just down the street from there on Henley, and I thought we had we thought we had a great picture of it that I was going to put in the slide uh, uh, slideshow, but it turned out to be the wrong house. And uh, my my researcher or my image researcher Brent will absolutely not tell you that it's something it's not. <laughs> so it was in the same vicinity, but it was not the right house. So we're, we're going to keep looking. Maybe we'll find something. It's odd, you know, back in the day, people just didn't think that taking a picture of their house was all that important. So, but she, she would have been standing, uh, this is probably what she, uh, what she looked like. Maybe this was taken the day of the banquet or, or the day, cause she has those roses, but she was just a block or so from where she lived. Her house was kind of important because it was sort of the kind of a de facto uh, women's building before we had one. Now, this is a, a, a poster uh, or advertisement for a lecture that she was going to give when she was running for uh, city council. <laughs> and um, she is, uh, 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 I thought it was kind of nice to show that she was, uh, she was, she saw herself as a, an elocutionist and she had written her own textbook on the art of elocution. So, she was quite a good speaker, and uh, so, uh, lots of people who came to talk to her uh, showed up, you know, wanting to her ha heckle her or harass her, and soon found themselves on her side because she was such an excellent speaker and such a convincing speaker. Uh, these are some of the other ladies. Lizzie did not march alone, as I like to say on the uh, tours, and these are some of the ladies who are uh, very important to the movement around here. Uh, Annie Davis, of course, was elected in that 1924 election. She was elected to the Tennessee State House, only the third woman to serve there. And she is, of course, known as the, um, uh, her nickname is the mother of the Smoky Mountains Park. So she worked very hard for that, uh, for that bill to uh, purchase the, uh, the property that would become the, the Smoky Mountains Park. And Annie was sort of a, uh, she wasn't a, a, a very push forward kind of person, really. She felt that rather than try to argue with the legislators and convince them one-on-one, uh, -on -one, she just arranged for them all to come out and see it. So they had this big trip where the entire her legislature came and visited the Smokies and they, they voted for it unanimously. <laughs> she was a smart woman. She knew that the beauty of the scenery and the part of where she wanted the park to be would be a much better argument for anything that, that, than anything she could say. Uh, Irene Haskell is a, uh, a particular favorite of mine, she was uh, uh, elected to the, uh, um, I believe the, uh, the election commission 
And she, she was pretty active in politics anyway. Her husband was Sam High School. He was mayor of Knoxville five times, not consecutively. <laughs> Jack can tell you exactly when he, was, when he served, but uh, he, was, he was already mayor of Knoxville when he met her. And she was the state librarian in the Capitol building in Nashville. And apparently he took one look at her and announced to everyone there that he was going to marry this woman. <laughs> and you can see she was a pretty woman, even as she, even when she was older. So he, he sent her red roses every single day until they married in 19, in 1887. <laughs> so he, he managed to win her over and he brought her back to Knoxville. She was a very ardent Democrat. She worked very hard for the Democratic Party. Uh, even when she wasn't in a in office, she was doing all kinds of volunteer work, uh, holding fundraising uh, luncheons and uh, guests, uh, looking for guest speakers for the different committees that she was on. She did a lot of volunteer work. Um, sadly, she was uh, uh, had cancer. She was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was uh, in her late forties had a double mastectomy. And in her later years, uh, after Sam died in 1923, I think that specter of her illness kind of hung over her head. And uh, she also had some financial reverses. So she was still active in the Democratic um, Party here in Knoxville when she died in 1936. And I have to be ever grateful to Jack for pointing her out to me because when he said, well, she, she died in 1936, she jumped off the Henley Street Bridge. I said, what? <laughs> I said, you realize suicides are often have a ghost story attached. He said, oh, so this is going to work for you on several levels. <laughs> so it's true. You know, anytime I hear a suicide, I immediately go start looking for the ghost story. And sure enough, I found one. <laughs> so uh, uh, she's now on two of my tours. <laughs> she's on a ghost tour and she's also on the Misbehaving Women tour. Um, I think most of you would recognize the picture of Mary Utopia Rothrock. This is when she was very young, but she was very young when she first came to Knoxville in 1917 at the age of 26. She was probably one of the most accomplished librarians that the uh, public library ever had. She uh, started the, um, she was the president of the Tennessee Library Association pretty early on and she organized the Southe South Southeastern Association and became its first president. In, uh, in 1920, all this time, she's also working for, for the vote because she was a very outspoken suffragist as well. Uh, one of probably her most famous uh, um, event uh, as a suffragist was after the vote was, was uh, earned in 1920. In 1930, she had a well-publicized debate with Mayor Jack Trent. He had asked women who were employed to give up their jobs because this is the beginning of the depression and he thought these women should give up their jobs and let a man have it and she pretty much reamed him out in public <laughs> and just kind of left him speechless she said you assume your jobless men could take the place of your employed woman but could they women get their jobs and hold their jobs because they're better at the work than men <laughs> and she went on and just as i said she she the mayor was speechless at the end so she definitely won the debate one of my favorite quotes about uh, uh, Mary Utopia Rothrock was uh, by one of her opponents who said, uh, uh, that red-haired librarian, she's dangerous. You never know when she's going to break out. <laughs> so, uh, I honor her for being a, sort of a loose cannon. And people were a little bit scared of how smart she was. Now, Mary Boyce Temple, and this is one of my favorite pictures of her. Um, she's very, uh, she is young still, but this is, a, I think, a more flattering picture of her than the one we have in the book, because you can see what a pretty woman she was. And she, it was her choice not to marry, however. You know, I, 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 when I first heard of Mary Boyce Temple, I was always told about how grumpy she was and how nobody, you know, she never, you know, that's why she was never married because she was just hard to get along with. But I believe it was her choice. She was a woman who had enough money to do what she wanted to do. She was the first Southerner to graduate from Vassar in 1877. And she uh, felt like she didn't really need a man, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, she was, had a very busy life. She traveled all over the world as the uh, Tennessee representative for you know, state uh, uh, world exhibitions. The governor would choose her because she spoke several languages. She's very well educated. And of course, we know her here mostly in Knoxville as one of our first preservationists for saving the Blunt Mansion in 1925. And one of the, uh, as I was researching Mary Boyce Temple, I found that her one of her friends, Sophie Harrell, was one of our early businessmen businesswomen here in Knoxville. She had an antique shop in the Vendome Hotel called The Dugout, and it was Sophie Harrell who helped uh, Miss Temple find period pieces to put in the Blunt Mansion. So 
Uh, of course, by the time the Blunt Mansion was made into a museum, all the family things had been sold off. So they had to go out and try to find antiques of the right period to, to refurnish it. And between Miss Temple and Miss Harrell, they were able to scour the area and find the right period of the antiques to put in there. Now this has several pictures that are also in the book of different women that we talk about. Um, I don't want to take up too much time uh, on e every picture, but this one I uh, particularly want you to notice Ethel Benson Beck, who I think is just a beautiful woman. Uh, she was a very active uh, Democrat. Her husband, however, was a Republican. <laughs> but according to Dr. Booker, she just took great, she with great glee, she would announce that she had canceled his vote <laughs> whenever there was an election. She would go out and vote on the opposite ticket of what he was voting for. Um, they were a very new united couple, uh, even though they uh, were competitive in a lot of ways. She was a competitive tennis player. I was a tennis umpire in one of my other lives. And uh, I was really impressed to see that she she won the Knoxville championship several years in a row here, but she was a pretty much on the, there was a colored tennis circuit and she was a national co uh, competitor at that level. Um, she um, also had was a, a prime mover in the Black Children's Orphanage, which I think was originally called the Payne Orphanage for, for, for colored children, but it was renamed for her. Uh, because of all the contributions that she made in it. She was on the board for many, many years, and she um, uh, was listed in various newspaper articles as the uh, as the matron, the director, a board member, and as the president of the board. So she was obviously very involved, and it was renamed because of all the uh, efforts she had put into it in her honor. Now, they had no children of their own, she and her husband, um, Robert, uh, uh, James Beck, and she had uh, married in... Uh, 18, in 1913, and, but she they never had any children of their own. They did a lot of investing in real estate, which would allow them to be pretty successful, and they could pursue their interests that way. And when they retired is when they moved to 1927 Dandridge Avenue, where the Beck Museum is today. So that was their basically their retirement home. And uh, the sale of the orphanage, the orphanage that bore her name was closed back in 1950s and the sale of that property funded the establishment of the Beck Cultural Exchange Center at the, in, on Dandridge Avenue in 1975. So we have a, a, a lasting memorial to Miss Beck and I'm glad that that's there because I don't want any, anyone to ever forget who she was. Uh, the lady next to her is also to me one of the most important people in our early educational uh, system for uh, her race was Laura Ann Kanzler, and she was born in slavery, but uh, she wasn't a slave herself. She was always free. Her father was a free black man in North Carolina, but after the Nat Turner Rebellion, he, the laws of North Carolina was very, were very punitive toward free blacks, so he decided to move his family and was originally going to go to, up to Ohio and on to Canada, but he came through Knoxville and found this Quaker community of Friendsville. And of course they accept, they believed in gender equality and uh, racial equality. So they were accepted as equals there and were very happy in Friendsville until 1861. <laughs> now that's when Tennessee seceded of course. And the uh, troops of John Hunt Morgan who was one of the Confederate generals who was, uh, came to Knoxville for a few months in 1862. But his troops were pretty well known for uh, targeting free black people and her father's farm uh, had gotten raided and they took their livestock and their valuables and even kidnapped her brother Billy. Uh, fortunately Billy was able to escape but they felt unsafe in Friendsville after that and that's why they ended up moving to Knoxville in 1861 because uh, the, what the uh, what um, Morgan's troops were doing was completely illegal, of course. So they, here in Knoxville, those folks had to follow the law and they felt much more protected, even though it was still a Confederate city under Confederate military control. Um, this was where she made the uh, acquaintance of Thomas Humes. And Thomas Humes uh, took her and her brother Billy as students in his home. Uh, he had been fired from St. John's <laughs> for not, not for being a unionist. Basically, he refused to pray for the success of the Confederate Army. And so he was taking students, uh, tutoring them in his home. And uh, she, she and Billy came to him and asked to, to take lessons. He taught them there in Later in 1864, Laura Ann went to uh, Ambrose Burnside, who had taken over Knoxville by that time, and asked to start a school for the freed slaves. And 
that was the very first public school in Knoxville. We did not have public schools for white people in that in 1864. So she is our very first public school teacher. And she also had three children who became educators. She said that was one of the proudest moments of her life when her three children decided to be teachers. Uh, one of them was Charles Cancer, and he wrote a book called uh, Three Generations of a Colored Family in East Tennessee, uh, which I uh, was fortunate to find online. It's really hard to find because it's out of print, but I was able to find an online version and read the whole thing. And that's where uh, he dedicated it to his mother. He said she wrought well for, with what she had, which I think was very true. She didn't, uh, she didn't really have a lot of advantages. Uh, her biggest advantage was that she was born a free black person and felt, had a family that felt her worth uh, and kept her self-worth up. But other than that, she had a lot to fight against, but she did very well. Uh, the other thing that she said made her proudest in her life was when she was chosen to be president of the first uh, uh, black uh, women's temperance league in uh, in Knoxville, and that was uh, that was at the Logan Temple. That was met uh, it met there, and the the national suffragist Frances Willard came to Knoxville in a, in order to organize that. Uh, that's one of the things she did while she was here. I'll just really briefly talk about Jane Denny, who was also elected uh, in that first 1924 election. She only served one term, but she was a very well-known woman in the suffragist movement here. She did a lot of volunteer work for the Red Cross during the First World War and uh, was sent overseas even after as part of the expeditionary force after the war was over. So she had a lot of experience with organizing people and raising money and and. I think she, uh, because of her experience there, she had realized that women in needed to club together, <laughs> needed to uh, stay organized and be uh, uh, part of a uh, an organization. So she did a lot of work for the uh, first suffrage organization here in Knoxville that Lizzie Crozier French formed in 1910, and she had a husband who was a, um, a editor at the Knoxville. Um, Journal and Tribune, so he helped her publicize the suffragist activities, and she was a great a great help to everyone in the league because she got them space in the paper. Another lady who wrote a lot of articles for the paper is Sarah H. Hood, and she was a prominent Knoxville club woman, but she uh, took over as a vice president of the Political Equity League, and, and she uh, she would organize letter writing campaigns to legislators. She would put articles in the paper. Uh, there are several of them with her byline that talk about the advantages of suffrage and just try to educate the public about what they were trying to accomplish. Um, Mabel Rule, who's next to her, is a really interesting story because she was basically kept a very low profile. I don't know if she was in favor of suffrage or not. She was basically was a, a smart girl who worked hard and made good. Uh, she was the first woman elected as court clerk, and she was the actually the first deputy court clerk as well before she could vote. So uh, her previous uh, employer had uh, uh, Frank Anderson uh, was a court clerk, and he had her previous employer had uh, promoted her to deputy court clerk. And so when Mr. Anderson took over the position, he just kept her on as deputy. And when he passed away, she was a, she was the first person everyone considered to be qualified for that position. Um, the other two here are Bill Carnes Morris and Julia Grassley Miller, and these are both early uh, members of the school board. Before they could vote, these women were on the school board in Knoxville, and Julia Grassley Miller was generally referred to in the paper. It took me forever. To, in fact, I had to get uh, Jack and Paul to help me find her real, her first name and her, her birth name, which was Julia Grassley, but Julia Rose Grassley, but uh, she was always referred to as Mrs. T.P. Miller. Uh, her husband was a doctor named Dr. T Thomas Peacock Miller, so no wonder he didn't want people to know about that middle name, but um, they, uh, that's how they always referred to her, but she was a very, very active member of the school board, as it was appointed in 1917, and uh, made the paper several times because she was always arguing with her male counterparts <laughs> about the rights of certain teachers. In one particular case, they wanted to replace a female principal with uh, a young male teacher and she said no 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 this woman has she has the seniority and she has the experience that he doesn't have so he's not qualified and she is and 
sorry, I'm not going to vote for that. So uh, she was not afraid to argue with men on the school board. Bill Carnes Morris was very much beloved by uh, both the black community and the poor white community here. She was a lady who started out, she was an Oxford native. She started out as a teacher, taught in several different schools around the area, briefly uh, left town to go to uh, Somerville, but she only stayed there a little bit. She came back to Knoxville and was teaching, I believe, at um, uh, Camp Grove School when she met her husband, Dr. Walter Morris, who was a, a veterinary doctor. And he was a, actually a veterinary dentist, which was sort of a specialty. And she, um, when they married, she left her teaching position, but she continued to volunteer for the school and was so uh, involved in it that when they laid the cornerstone for a new building for the Camp Grove School, they named it after her because uh, it's, so we still have Bell Morris uh, School uh, in North Knoxville. And she uh, continued to work for, and she's on the school board three different terms. She worked for the uh, rights of, of poor children. She wanted, wanted to make sure that they had uh, uh, free lunch. Uh, also the rights of black children to have uh, clean, uh, clean and safe teaching uh, uh, educational facilities. She would plant shrubs, she loved flowers. So she would plant fl flowers and shrubs at all these different schools. And unfortunately that's, uh, she died and she had just, she had dug up 60 iris bulbs in one morning and uh, came in and ate lunch and then laid down to rest afterwards and apparently had a heart attack and died. And the bulbs were to be planted on the grounds of Bill Morris School, and they were supposed to have a big festival the next day. And instead, they had basically a, a memorial service for Miss for Miss Morris, and everyone was very, very great. Even the principal broke down in tears when uh, when they had to have this service. Now, Jack mentioned the uh, uh, dramatic story on the courthouse steps. These are those steps. Uh, November twenty seventh, nineteen seventeen, was the date of the showdown in. Uh, Knoxville, and uh, suffragists had been picketing the White House in 1917. Several of them had been arrested, and then when they got out of prison, they had these lecture tours to educate the public about the horrible treatment they received in the jails, and this really turned the tide of, of American opinion uh, against uh, the people who had arrested them and for suffrage. Well, one of these ladies was called the Millionaire Waitress, and she was an heiress who had gone, gone undercover in California to form a labor union for the California waitresses. Now this is her and her name was Maud Younger. And she, I'm glad she's in an evening gown here because they locked her out of the courthouse. <laughs> she was First they canceled her con contract at the market hall. Then they locked her out of the courthouse. The, dep the sheriff up until recently had been in control of the building. So he padlocked all the doors and uh, put armed de deputies on guard outside them and re refused to let the ladies come in, even though the uh, judge had given them access to the courtyard and had written permission for them to use it. But she uh, she was a very smart woman. Uh, she turned around, I'll give you the steps again. She's standing at the top of these steps and she turned around and saw 500 people gathered on the north lawn of the courthouse. And she said to uh, Lizzie and the other suffragists that were sitting there arguing with the sheriff with her, she turned around and said, well, the sheriff has the courthouse, but I have the audience. <laughs> so she turned around and started speaking right there from the steps. And she had no microphone. She had no coat. She had on an evening gown with a light wrap. And that's why I said, I'm glad she's wearing an evening gown there because you can picture her there at the top of the steps and just this light wrap. And she, she gave her speech, which began, I think, with the words, it is not for me to settle the question of free speech. It is for you people out there. And she just held them in thrall for 45 minutes and then spent 20 more minutes answering questions. And many, many people here in Knoxville probably uh, ad admired her determination and her uh, devotion to the cause. And I'm sure she was a big factor in turning a lot of East Tennesseans towards the suffrage cause. Several people in the crowd agreed to write to their legislators after that speech. Now I'm gonna go on. This is another uh, down the rabbit hole uh, research thing with me and John Paul and Jack will tell you that the article in the book was much, much longer <laughs> when I finished it. And I, I still am fascinated by the Knoxville Female Academy, which was later known as the East Tennessee Female Institute. This is the first building, which was on the upper part of where the parking lot of Church Street United Methodist Church is today. Uh, the original building is probably that building in the center, and they had these two other buildings, the smaller buildings built on later. This started uh, in 
in 1827. So part of the, my, my theory about how, why East Tennesseans were so pro suffragists, we had schools for women very, very early on that taught hard sciences like chemistry and physics and rhetoric and logic. And they made these women do exams that were just as rigorous as anything that the male students in male academies had to do. And here's a picture of the same building with some of the students there in front of it. Many of the early students, of course, didn't live long enough to be have names in the, to be part of the suffrage movement when leagues started forming here in Knoxville. But these were most, the list of students of the early years were the McClungs, the Whites, many of the prominent uh, families of Knoxville, the Croziers, of course, were on the list as well. In fact, uh, Lizzie's grandfather, John Crozier, was one of the biggest uh, financial contributors to this building, and he had given $100 towards building this building in, eight, in uh, 18, uh, 1812, I think is when, they, when he made that donation. Um, so, because they had uh, many of the presidents or principals of the female academy and the East Tennessee Female Institute were uh, later went on to teach at male colleges. One of them was um, Joseph Estabrook, who was president of UT for many, many years. And before it was, it was East Tennessee College when he was president of it. But uh, many of them, of the teachers later on would also be college professors for men. And some of them would go on to, to uh, established colleges for men after working at the Female Institute. So I know that the quality of education here. Now, uh, Lizzie was, when she was part of this organization, it was from 1885 to 1890, and it was this older building that Lizzie was uh, co-principals with her younger sister, Lucy. And Lucy was a mathemat mathematician, and I am planning to do a little bit more research about her because I'd like to know more about Lucy Crozier. She was apparently a 98 pound, four foot tall young one, <laughs> little woman that was just uh, extremely intelligent, very good at math. And uh, she was uh, Lizzie's co-principal and basically her partner in a lot of suffrage activities. Uh, Lizzie was there at the show, uh, Lucy was there at the showdown in the courthouse and in fact was the only person to get inside because she was small enough to slip under the sheriff's uh, arm. <laughs> she, came, she sneaked past him and started berating the deputies about not letting them in. So uh, this was what it looked like when Lizzie and Lucy were in charge. Now the trustees who owned the building decided in 1890, uh, well actually late 1889, they had decided to sell the land and tear down, have the building torn down. Uh, Lizzie got wind of this. She uh, tried to persuade them not to, but in fact, she had a letter to the editor uh, in Knoxville, a journal and Tribune, I think was uh, saying this is a bad decision and she hoped they would change their minds to no avail, so she gave her resignation in the spring of 1890 and went on to uh, become more and more involved in suffrage, uh, suffrage work. The trustees did end up building another female school, which is this building right here. It was built in 18, finished in 1892 and opened as the East Tennessee Female Institute of Music. <laughs> of arts and music. So this was a little bit more of the finishing school mo model than the other previous ones had been. It was more of a secondary uh, high school rather than a, a college, but it still had a fairly good reputation, had some very notable students. And uh, this building lasted up until the 1960s. It was in the lower part of the uh, what is now the parking lot of Church Street United Methodist Church. And it was uh, in the 1960s uh, that that building was torn down uh, to expand the parking lot. Now, this uh, part of the book talks about the rise of women's clubs and their relationship to suffrages, uh, suffrage movements. You know, organization, uh, the ability to raise money for certain causes and for charity, the ability to, to do good as a group was a very powerful feeling for women. And uh, the women's club movement is very much part of the suffrage part, uh, movement as well. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the chapter about women's clubs in the book. And this is the first women's building. Now, Lizzie's house over on Cumberland was the, kind of the de facto women's building I found out when I was researching because her, a lot of these clubs met in the basement of her <laughs> house. And when she formed the women's industrial and uh, educational union, they met in the basement of her house. And that's where the first employment agency for that organization ran, okay, was out of the Crozier house. So by 1898, they had their own building. And this had been originally created for the uh, state centennial celebration by Alfred Ballman, Albert Ballman, one of our famous architects. 
The ladies thought it was too beautiful just to tear it down. So they raised money and were able to get the city to allow them to put it on the corner of Main and Prince, which is about halfway down the block where the crosswalk is. Uh, the old courthouse grounds is what that was, uh, where that was, uh, where our first three courthouses were built on the corner of Main and Prince. It unfortunately, this is sort of the center of, of, of arts and cultural activity. Several famous uh, Knoxville artists, uh, Eleanor Wiley, uh, Catherine Wiley had studios in this building. Uh, a lot of entertainments took place, several clubs that still meet today, the Ossily Circle and the uh, Tuesday Morning Musical Club who still meet today are or had club rooms in this building. Unfortunately, it burned down in 1906 in a fire that they think was caused by the, it was on Christmas Eve and they think it was caused by the annual uh, tradition of blowing up things on Christmas Eve back in the day, which Jack has done a lot of stories about. Uh, this was the second women's building. And with the addition, you can see sort of towards the back there, they, the auditorium, you see, this was added on There's a skylight. And this is part, this part of the auditorium. This is the William Gass home is an earlier mayor of Knoxville, and it was up for sale. And uh, when the women's building burned down, the me women immediately organized to finance another building and had this one bought by 1908. They had the money together and uh, started uh, letting clubs meet in it, but during the renovation, which was when they added on this section. And I think it's kind of neat. You can see these arched windows and I'm gonna, this is a repeat of the, uh, one of the pictures that Jack showed earlier, but see, you can see that's where, the, that's where this was. The, the windows match uh, the outside view there. Uh, and it also became a center for uh, art and cultural activity and also suffrage activity. In fact, uh, I think I've got, this was a ticket for the dinner that night. <laughs> so if you wanted to come to a perfect 36 and be one of the immortals, this is the ticket that you had to pay for one dollar. <laughs> so I expect it would be a little bit more today, but uh, pretty, pretty cool idea. Um, this, of course, is the statue of Harry Byrne and his mother, Feb. Uh, Feb is actual size. She was actually six feet tall, like the statue. Unfortunately, they again decided to make her look too young to have a son that old. <laughs> so this is what she really looked like when suffrage passed. And she was a very intelligent woman. Uh, of course, she was very proud of her son, who was the youngest member of the delegation. And it was probably her letter that turned the scale uh, and caused him to change his vote. Um, he had been under pressure from his party leaders, but also from other party members to uh, uh, one of his mentors had, was very much anti-suffrage. And she read a letter, a, a speech by uh, Senator Chandler that was this very, very racist, very anti-suffrage. And she, that's what inspired her to write the letter to Harry because she wanted to see, uh, she wanted to tell him she needed him. She wanted him to support this, this vote. Um, when he changed his vote, of course, there were smear con uh, tactics. The Knoxville papers covered so that they had, uh, there was a story that they had tried to say he had accepted a bribe to change his vote. They also tried to get, uh, I had tried to run a story saying that Feb had not written that letter, had not asked him to, to change his vote. And this is the telegram that <laughs> she sent. <laughs> said, you know, don't listen to these people. I know she said, she said, support, support suffrage to the end. So she was very, very vehement in her support of suffrage. Now it's seven now, and I do have more slides that are just of the different sites that we talk about, and uh, most of which everybody will recognize. Of course, this is an old version of the Customs House before it became uh, the museum uh, edition was put on in 2005, but the statue is that we just looked at is right here at the corner where you can still see the weather kiosk, which is over hundred years old as well. So the statue is about in this area. Uh, we do have a site description section in the book and it kind of takes you through the places that are still there, places like the Andrew Johnson building where um, the debate that I mentioned earlier took place. And also Margaret Burke White, the fer fam famous female photographer came in the 1940s. Uh, this is the Armstein building, which was built by Lala Armstein's husband. She was also elected as a, one of the first, uh, sort of, it was called a, a justice of the peace, but it was similar to a, a uh, county commissioner these days. So she started, she served till 1930, till uh, Max retired and they moved away. So she was, uh, she was one of our first women elected as well. And of course, the Bijou has lots of associations with different women over the years, but um, its first owner was a woman. Uh, Margaret Humes, uh, 
turned to, her husband had died during the construction in 1817. And in, in those days, you weren't allowed to uh, inherit your husband's property, but fortunately for her, she was pregnant. <laughs> so she was able to get them to put her down as administrator of the estate. And uh, she had a boy, she named him after his father. So uh, it was, uh, you know, the first, first hotel owned by a woman probably in Tennessee. And it was the largest hotel in Tennessee when it opened in 1817, because it had a dining room, a ballroom, a tavern and a bar, a kitchen and 13 guest rooms. So, and yeah, this, of course, is the Farragut, which is uh, takes up the space where the Crozier House used to be. It would have kind of been in the back corner that's sort of away from us here. And uh, that was the childhood home of Lizzie Crozier French. Uh, the, uh, of course, the Farragut itself is was famous, has had several famous guests over the years. Uh, we mentioned some of those in the site descriptions. One of them, of course, was Carrie Chapman Cat herself, who came in August of 1920, probably because, as Jack pointed out, the uh, uh, Representative Anderson's office was right across the street and he had not given his <laughs> given his definite yes for the vote yet. So she probably wanted to come check on him and see if she couldn't nudge him into the right direction. Apparently she was successful because as Jack said about a week before the vote, he, he said that he was gonna vote for. So this is the uh, graveyard of the First Presbyterian Church, which again is another uh, site where uh, that's mentioned in the site description because uh, one of our uh, uh, Margaret uh, Hume, Margaret Cowan Hume's uh, Ramsey, the woman I mentioned earlier who owned the hotel, is buried here. Uh, she's kind of out of sight of this picture up in the corner, but also one of their our early, uh, uh, I guess you would call him an obstetric surgeon at this time. Uh, today, he was uh, one of the William Baker, who performed one of the first successful hysterectomies in the in the country, is also buried here. And this is the Logan Temple as it looked, and this is what's there today, the Morgan, uh, 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 Marble Alley Lofts. But this is where Ida, Ida Wells and uh, Mary Church Terrell both probably came into this building. The African Americans Political League formed here in 1919. Uh, so they, even though they had to keep a low profile, uh, women in Knoxville still formed clubs and they, they participated in political action in spite of uh, the fact that they weren't really much welcomed at, at a lot of suffrage, suffrage meetings. This is Mary Boyce Temple's house, of course, which is now the Temple Pittman House and has been beautifully restored to look a lot like it did when she lived in it in 19, uh, from 1922 to her death in 1929. And this is the Park House. Uh, it is on the suffrage tour because during World War I, this was where the Red Cross headquarters were. And the contribution of women to uh, the First World War through their volunteer efforts were one of the things that helped change people's minds about women being involved uh, in suffrage because they they could they really could contribute to a war effort and they really did during World War I. They uh, did a, a wonderful amount of work uh, raising money, selling liberty bonds. Uh, of course, they sent off packages to the soldiers. And as I mentioned before, one of our uh, first elected female officials, Jane Denny, was very involved here at the, at the Red Cross in the cross in the expeditionary force after it was over. And this is the church right across the street. Uh, Lizzie Crozier French was known to attend here occasionally because her sister Lucy and her sister Mary both attended here. Uh, also, Lucy Templeton, one of our very first uh, female uh, uh, newspaper reporters, uh, she, she attended this church and she was one of the first women to become a society editor uh, of, a, of a newspaper here in Knoxville. And this is the YWCA. Uh, I have it in, uh, in the tour and in the book because Florence Payne, who started it, was very much a social reformer. And we don't know what her views on suffrage were, but she, uh, she was very much into protecting women from the dangers of uh, vice and alcohol. And uh, that was part of the reason she got involved in the YWCA. And we were one of the early chapters in 1899 was when the chap first chapter in Knoxville uh, uh, formed and that at that time there weren't that many uh, in small cities, small cities of this side, there, there weren't that many uh, chapters of the YWCA. Well, I'm going to stop now and just let Paul take this back and only stop sharing here. 
and let you guys ask questions if anybody's still sticking around or if Jack has anything else he'd like to say. So yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, that, that's uh, that was great, great, Laura. Uh, uh, I always learn, always learn something uh, from uh, from your further further research. You never you never quit, do you? You're always uh, <laughs> you know, finding more stuff. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention a little coda. I mentioned the the stories of the Knoxville delegation were kind of were kind of uh, were kind of sad. Uh, the uh, after that triumph in in the uh, August of 1920, uh, uh, Joey Wade, the youngest member of the delegation, uh, uh, had a family lived downtown, and but he got sick and died a couple of years later. Um, uh, W.K. Anderson was reelected. Uh, actually, Joey Wade had been reelected to uh, the legislature after the vote, uh, and and uh, W.K. Anderson was reelected as well. Uh, but he had a stroke in uh, in office, and um, and in those days there were no social safety nets. And it's amazing that this guy, who was an attorney uh, by trade, had been an attorney for a U.S. senator. Had been uh, had he had been a, a legislator had made this historic vote uh, in in uh, that, that changed you know changed the country, um, and he uh, you know was well respected guy, at, but he had a stroke and he couldn't work and he he went broke quick and he was actually living uh, a kind of a uh, living in in a in a borrowed apartment downtown as early just about ten years after that vote. And soon was in the poorhouse, the county poorhouse. He was living in the poorhouse out at Maloneyville uh, in the mid 1930s. And a reporter went out there just to talk about the poorhouse and how uh, the New Deal effects were going to affect the people, uh, these people that, that uh, were expecting to get Social Security, this brand new idea. And they interviewed this guy and they, they didn't recognize him. They said, W.K. Anderson says he used to be a lawyer. That's all they said. They didn't say that he used to be a, a state legislator. They didn't say that he made a vote that that changed the country and gave us a the Nineteenth Amendment. Uh, they didn't say anything about that. They said he says he used to be a lawyer, as if maybe he was he was lying. But uh, anyway, it's uh, it's uh, uh, all these guys were completely uh, forgotten. Uh, but but uh, uh, Harry Byrne lived longer and and lived into the era of the nineteen fifties when. Uh, the East Tennessee Historical Society had him as a speaker in the 1950s, and by that time, this was seen as a historically important period that he had uh, that he had affected. And so he uh, got to got got had the privilege of living long enough to see that this was important and not just something that happened last year. So uh, that's uh, that's that's my 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 end. Does anybody have any questions about any of these things? It's a, a big, complicated story, and and, and Laura's book kind of takes it from the 1880s really up until the 21st century in some ways we have uh, you know modern female legislators because we, we were still having firsts uh, you know in recent years in terms of uh, women in in, uh, in office um, and uh, uh, would like to you know, would like to keep not be, be sure people don't forget about these things as I think we we have I've seen many lists over the years in the newspapers when they talk about the first woman in city council or whatever, and they usually start with Bernice O'Connor in the 1960s, because the first one people remember. And, and then, but there were others before that and, uh, that people don't remember, but we try to, to record all these people so they won't be, be forgotten, uh, I hope again.